So let me introduce our keynoter. Robert Lipsight uh, became, in the words of the title to his own autobiography, an accidental sports writer. He intended, the bio on his website says, to head for California after college and seek his fortune as a book and movie writer. But first he needed a summer job, and that job turned out to be as a copy boy in the sports department at the New York Times, a job he describes as one he spotted in the classified section. Uh, it's hard to imagine the New York Times placing a classified ad today for a summer uh, job. He says he hated that job, actually, but discovered that he loved working at the newspaper, so he stayed. And at age 21, he became a sports reporter covering the New York Mets spring training in their inaugural year. And then two years later, the classic Cassius Clay, Sonny Liston heavyweight fight. And not long thereafter, he became a sports columnist for the Times. Books continued to beckon, however, and in 1971, he left newspapering to write novels, which he did, while doing <clears throat> journalistic work also for NPR, CBS Sunday Morning, NBC, and PBS. In 1991, he returned to the Times as a sports columnist, only to leave the paper again in 2002 to immerse himself once more in fiction writing. Then, in 2013, he agreed to serve 18 months as ESPN's ombudsman, a term that ended late last year, and a position that industry-wide has been shrinking uh, dramatically over the past uh, couple of decades in particular. In any case, it must have been an exciting 18 months. Among the issues, and I do mean among the many, many issues he wrestled with, the use by ESPN and others of what he calls, in his own writing, the R word for the Washington professional football team. ESPN's removing its name from the frontline program, League of Denial, um, which we heard mentioned this morning. The appropriate boundaries of our uh, sideline interviews with controversial college athletes. Bill Simmons calling NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell a liar when he claimed he didn't know what was on the video showing professional football player Ray Rice punching his girlfriend and then daring ESPN to punish him. The suspension of a variety of other ESPN commentators for ill-advised and inappropriate language and comments. ESPN's coverage of Michael Sam as an openly gay football player. ESPN's coverage of the now former NBA owner Donald Sterling. Racism and so on. Now if you read Bob's posts and transcripts, tra chat transcripts, you will immediately discover that he did not hesitate to criticize in the best sense of the word, uh, nor did he hesitate to be candid. Here, for example, is a random assortment of remarks on the fact that he believed ESPN to have done a good job of covering the Ray Rice domestic abuse issue and NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell's handling of it, quote, I'd like to say I wasn't the least bit surprised, but I was. Or on Bill Simmons' attack on Roger Goodell uh, and his public daring of ESPN to punish him, quote, Simmons is, in my opinion, ESPN's franchise player, but by no stretch a leading journalist. On his 45th birthday, Thursday, my gift to him was recounting my favorite quote from basketball coach Butch Van Bredekoff, everyone's strength is their weakness. He said he liked it. In Simmons' case, it has to do with his driving energy and creativity, which can morph into tunnel vision and self-absorption. On Twitter, as a medium, I know some of you are going to like this. I'm old school. I think Twitter is only a proper vehicle for insulting enemies and marriage proposals. <laughs> uh, journalism is about getting it right, and it's almost never possible to do that in 140 characters. Or, in one of his final posts last year, quote, in the early days of my ombudsmanship, a senior ESPN executive suggested I stay away from conflict of interest as a topic in my upcoming columns. It was an irrelevant issue, he said, and nothing more than a way for lazy critics to attack, e to attack ESPN, unquote. And then he proceeded to write about just that. I haven't yet mentioned that he is the author of at least 26 books, adult and young adult fiction and nonfiction, 
I looked in the uh, library uh, card catalog, the electronic catalog uh, here. I see we have 19 of his books uh, in the UW-Madison libraries. And most of these draw on his interest and experience with sports journalism, or in general, his own life's journey. So prolific is an understatement in his case. His career can only be characterized as varied and remarkable, as varied and remarkable as it is successful. There have been ma many major honors along the way, not surprisingly, to name but four, an em Emmy as the host of the 11th Hour, a nightly PBS public affairs show, runner-up for a Pulitzer in commentary for his sports column, Columbia University's Meyer Berger Award for distinguished reporting, twice, the Margaret a. Edwards Award from the American Library Association for Lifetime Contribution to Young Adult Literature. So you can see why we are very, very much pleased that he agreed to be our keynote speaker today. Please welcome Robert Lipsight. If I knew that Bob's introduction was going to be that fulsome, I would not speak and spoil the impression. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here at, at this. But I have to tell you right away, this is full disclosure, that ethics in journalism, particularly in sports journalism, has always been a somewhat elusive concept for me. Sometimes it seems like ethics is just plain common sense. Bill Simmons, if you call a subject a liar, you should have video of his pants on fire. And sometimes it seems like a diversion. How does a list of rules help us in covering, for example, big time college sports, as if it's some sort of scout jamboree instead of a carnival of corrupt practices. Except for Wisconsin, of course. <laughs> but I'm grateful that the University of Wisconsin Center for Sports Journalism Ethics is here to do the heavy lifting. And I'm particularly grateful uh, at its focus on sports journalism. I think that sports is a vital window on American culture. And very often, it's the first portal for young consumers of journalism. And you know how badly we need them. I like to entertain the creation myth that modern sports journalism and its ethical challenges were born a bit more than a century ago when Bat Masterson, yeah, that Bat Masterson, the deputy sheriff of Dodge City, Wyatt Earp's old sidekick, decided that sports writing was more exciting and lucrative than shooting people in the back. So he comes to New York City to be a sports editor and columnist. Uh, Bat was what we would now call a multi-platform operator. He covered the events that he also owned, promoted, and gambled on. Bat died in 1921 with his boots on at his desk at the New York Morning Telegraph in the middle of writing a sports column. A good death. But Bat's style did not die with him. Conflicts of interest, financial, emotional, professional, have dogged sports journalism ever since. It has reached full flower now at ESPN, where every day the worldwide leader covers events it owns, 
promotes, and in a corporate way, bets on. Um, I have not come here to trash ESPN, at least not particularly, Patrick. Uh, my editor and handler at ESPN, Patrick Spiegman, is here, a wonderful colleague. Uh, during my recent 18-month hitch at ES as ESPN's ombudsman, I came to admire a lot about its professionalism and its spirit. But as the most important media window on sports, ESPN bears close ethical watch and constructive criticism, as does Sports Illustrated, NBC Sports, Deadspin, certainly all of you out here who are purveyors of sports journalism. Sports media has enormous influence, I believe, on how we define and value aspects of gender, sexuality, race, and class. Whether it's how we cover or fail to cover. The uh, off-the-field activities of Jameis Winston, the Florida State quarterback, whose Heisman Trophy seems to have been a get-out-of-jail free card, read Walt Bogdanovich, who, Bogdanich, who, you, who you heard from this morning, or the more subtle implications of an NBA player Roy Hibbert, stopping in the middle of praising another ball player to declare of himself, no homo. Now, that's not just a jockish joke. It's a default expression from a guy who was afraid that you might question his definition of his own manhood. It's the expression of a jock culture that sports media has certainly helped disseminate. That's why I believe that the ethics of sports journalism needs to be more than an attempt to codify rules. It needs to be the starting point of an exploration of the purposes of sports coverage and journalism's relationship with sports in a time when everybody is filing copy and everything seems to be in flux. And the, the Twitterverse has exploded into this skyfall of whirling shards of rumor, speculation, and upcoming business deals. Now the Associated Press may have robots covering sports. I always thought they always did, but um, I'm hoping that the center will um, consult on the algorithms. And then there's Derek Jeter's contribution. After 20 years of being one of the dullest interviews in baseball, as you remember, the former Yankee shortstop said that he didn't want his life filtered through sports journalists. One of the first things he does on his retirement is become a magazine publisher, almost one of us. Um, I personally have been enjoying Jeter's digital sports magazine. I suggest you check it out. It's called the Players Tribune. It's a very lively public relations vehicle uh, for players. Um, and it kind of proves who needs people like us when you can have Tiger Woods attacking the ethics of Dan Jenkins. Tiger's attempt to define our job reminded me of past attempts. It was Ted Williams, the great slugger, who once said, pour hot water on a sports writer and you'll get instant shit. And then there was coach Bob Knight calling John Feinstein, then of the Washington Post, a pimp and a whore. 
John, who was very quick, replied, make up your mind so I know how to dress. <laughs> but, but Coach Knight's confusion, pimp or whore, is understandable. After 50 odd years in this business, I'm still wondering exactly what it is that a sports writer is. Are we a reporter, reviewer, investigator, feature writer? Are we supposed to turn over rocks to find the maggots underneath? Or just pick up the rocks and throw them at jocks in glass locker rooms? Are we supposed to expand and enhance the joy of the game? Are we here to cover sports as we would cover politics? The consumer uh, reports of democracy? Or are we here to be the cheerleaders of this particular reflection of our democracy? Are we philosophers, sociologists, technicians, cranks, comedians, the representatives of fans, on any given day, can we choose what we are? Are we ultimately firefighters or clowns? A large part of answering those questions is to push beyond the narrow approach to ethics in sports journalism, kind of the grammar and syntax of morality, and try to see ethics in a broader sense, which comes close to a willingness to improve our subjects as well as ourselves. Now, I'm not suggesting outright progressive advocacy. Thank goodness we have Dave Zirin to handle that. But I do think we need to cover sports in such a way to constantly make clear that sports matters, but there is something the matter with sports. If we don't, I think we are just part of the problem. And what are the ethics of that? As for improving ourselves, yes, I think we can all agree on the basics, and I don't think they're that hard. Accuracy, independence, and fairness. Um, is it true? Do I have a conflict of interest here? Am I representing all sides in this story and not equating one side, which I know to be bullshit, with one I know to be true in some cynical, easy, safe attempt at a phony balance? Um, clamping down on the promiscuous use of anonymous sources, very hard for investigative reporters, I know. Um, on plagiarism and on writing de facto press releases are very good things. But do they prevent such serious journalism crimes as allowing the NFL to control the concussion discussion or with college football's epidemic of sexual assault? Which really has a lot to do, as we expand the idea of ethics, with alcohol, the river on which so much sports floats, our sponsors very often as well. I've been marinating in these thoughts for a long time, especially in the two years given the time and space to do so by ESPN. For the first time, instead of covering stories directly, I was covering the coverage. And two stories in particular I found curiously eye-opening. One was the arrest of Aaron Hernandez. The other, the disclosure that the NFL had tried to suppress information that head injuries suffered in games was apparently leading to long-term deadly brain trauma. Hernandez, whose trial we could be watching on streaming, uh, are they, I don't know if the jury is, is contemplating now. Um, when, when the accusations were first reported, the initial media response was, how will losing Hernandez affect the dynamic of the Patriots? How would it impact 
Coach Bill Belichick's too tight end offense. Wow. Most sports reporters might as well have been working for the league, especially the so-called insiders with all their scoops on trades and draft picks. They knew that Hernandez arrived in the NFL with a substantial adult and juvenile record, some of it which was compiled in his and ESPN's hometown of Bristol, Connecticut, and that the Patriots decided to take a chance on a terrific player with, quote, character issues, uh, but would hedge its bets by waiting until the fourth round of the 210, uh, 2010 draft uh, and pay him later if he kept clean. Did the re Patriots have responsibilities that an ethical sports journalist should have picked up on then? How about this? If you hire a guy to risk serious physical injuries by performing violent acts for you, do you have any obligation to check on his mental state? Is there any connection between what seems like an epidemic of bad behavior among football players and their backgrounds or their training or the physical trauma they suffer? Any connections possible between the brain trauma that many troubled veterans suffer from after combat and football's head injuries? Is there any possibility that all the supposed psychological testing that NFL teams claim to do leads them right to young men with psychosocial problems? Do you think any effort to answer such questions is a logical extension of any concern we might have about the ethical responsibilities of sports journalists. Now, how would that work? Should the NFL embed therapists who players can talk to privately before their lives take terrible turns? Would that have prevented Jovan Belcher of the Kansas City Chiefs from murdering his girlfriend in front of their baby and then killing himself in front of his coaches. And what happens when a sports journalist does connect to a real life issue? In a brief, as you probably remember, in a brief essay during the halftime broadcast of a game in 2012, Bob Costas brought up gun control in what I thought was a kind of mild but thoughtful way. He mostly quoted a Jason Whitlock column. The standard response was, Bob Costas has gone nuts. He set off a frenzy when he decided to use the sports pulpit to opine about gun control. Frenzy, pulpit, opine. Pretty charged words for what seemed like kind of what he should have been doing. I wondered if the sports writer backlash was a combination of surprise and guilt, surprise to hear such profane thoughts in the church of sports, and guilt that so few of them ever express such thoughts. The other eye-opening story, which is still with us, was the revelation that not only is there a connection between playing football and sustaining brain trauma, but that the connection have been systematically downplayed, if not suppressed, by the NFL. Well, it seems as though the league was making a appropriate business decision, pragmatic, even if it was unconscionable. The league had a right to be worried about its investments. In recent months, the revelations of brain injury have led to a drop in Pee Wee and other youth football participation, as well as the announcement by a number of football stars that they would not allow 
their boys to play high school football. There's even been a kind of mini trend among successful NFL players to quit early in their careers for reasons of safety. The most shocking, of course, was the apostasy of the 24-year-old Wisconsin linebacker, Chris Borland, who quit the NFL after his rookie season on the brink of what looked like a highly successful pro career. He said he didn't want to risk his health. Borland had the support of his family. His father had kept him from playing football until high school. Why not have that right in front of my face? Um, and uh, both men declared it was not a money decision, but of course it was. Borland is white, middle class, a college graduate. He had options other than football. Speaking of ethics, he also said he would return three quarters of his signing bonus. Now, there's no reason to believe that all the reporters that have been covering college football in the NFL haven't been ethical in the narrow sense. Most of them, I hope, don't plagiarize each other. They try to limit the use of anonymous sources. And they don't take gifts of more than $25 from the teams they cover. But in a larger sense, they were profoundly unethical. Either they weren't doing their jobs, or they were lying to their audience. They watched games. They talked to owners, coaches, and players. They saw players get their, quote, bells rung, saw them stagger around, later tell kind of boastful stories about how bleary they were for the next couple of downs. They heard coaches praise the tough guys who shook it off. They knew about the pressure to play hurt or lose their jobs. They knew about the compromised team doctors who shot them up and sent them back on the field. And as we all have, they saw old players with slurred speech who struggled to get out of soft chairs. But too many of those reporters are dependent on access. They identify with the short-term best interests of the industry, not with the demands of an honest media or their audience. The audience found out about concussions because a few outsiders were curious and unafraid. They didn't really have that much to lose. Not unlike the young Washington Post reporters and Watergate. In this case, it was a New York Times freelancer named Alan Schwartz who connected the dots with the help of a young Nigerian-born medical examiner, Dr. Bennett Amala. Can't get more outside than that. And then some ESPN writers, Peter Keating, the brothers Steve Fainaru and Mark Fainaru Water, you heard from this morning, dug deep in articles, a book, and a PBS frontline documentary, which, as you heard about, ESPN took its name off. According to the New York Times, or as Mark refers to it, Walt's paper, uh, at the specific demand of the NFL commissioner, who was justifiably afraid that the revelations would cost the league money. So, forget about ESPN. Where were all the sports writers as the years of headbanging went on? Well, I'll tell you where they were. They were covering sports exactly as they had 17 years ago when baseball players were swelling into incredible hulks and going very deep. 
Now, do you remember how we turned the summer of 1998 into a fantasy about all that was right with America? Sammy Sosa, a dark-skinned Latino, and the very white Mark McGuire were dueling bats in pursuit of Roger Maris's home run record as the ghost of the Bambino looked on. The not-so-secret subtext was that this was an antidote to America's despair over President Clinton and Monica Lewinsky's stained blue dress. One reporter spoiled the fantasy. Mark Wilstein, no robot of the Associated Press, spotted a small brown bottle of the steroid supplement Andro in McGuire's locker. At the time, Andro was banned in the Olympics, but not in baseball. Wilstein wrote about it. He was immediately attacked by his colleagues for peaking. Unprofessional, they said. Unethical. Soon enough, that pesky Mark Fainaruwada dived in, and nowadays, Sosa and McGuire are considered artifacts of a supposedly long gone steroid age. The ethical, non peaking sports journalists, after peddling their happy days stories, have long since joined the chorus attacking the juicers, bad boys. And as is so often the common, common in, in stories such as this, it's never any kind of systemic attack on ownership, pressure, uh, the complicity of everybody around, but just these bad boys, a kind of cancer that can be cut out and make the body healthy and whole again. So why did this happen? Had these reporters been ethically refusing to spread rumors? Were they protecting their business interests? Was it an emotional and unprofessional attachment to the game? Or was it, as some admitted later, denial? Which is kind of a disease we all have to guard against. Last year, I questioned ESPN's flabby coverage of sexual assault by football players. Um, Rolling Stone magazine asked Chris Fowler, very popular host of ESPN's College Game Day, about that accusation. And he said, when you cover this sport, you always have to live in a bit of denial. You check some things at the door. It's entertainment. It's diversion. It's a distraction from the real world. You know, there are reasons for denial, of course. Denial certainly helps grease everyday life. Um, we've certainly all used it to advantage. But here, it seems to be a conscious attempt to avoid doing your job. If indeed, ethical journalism is the job and not pimp or whore extending and enhancing the game and its products. There's another way. Maybe we just have to be less serious about sports. Can we have fun anymore? New rules. I'm really sorry if some big back comes up demento after 10 years in the NFL, but hey, what did he expect? Banging heads like that. He made a Faustian bargain. He had his good times, 
his male bonding, his surrogate dads blowing their whistles, tucking him in before big games and professing to care about him. He had all those ladies in the lobby and million dollar contracts while we poor mooks sat in our living room cramming Doritos, slugging Bud, and feeling those kind of hot little rushes from those impossible catches of rainbow passes just before a cornerback plows in and wakes us up. Bang! Then the receiver pops up as if nothing happened. Could we ever be so talented, brave, and cool in anything we ever do? Dream on. That's being a sports fan. Deny it. So in about three weeks, on draft day, and this is the other side, does every single Jameis Winston story need to dredge up the Florida State quarterback's litany of misdeeds, along with a primer on sexual assault and the seemingly lenient treatment that athletes received from the universities and local police. Maybe not, but it does seem like a journalistic dereliction when that part of the story fades for such long stretches. Are the sins of commission an ethical consideration? Covering the final four, I know this is painful. Covering the final four, it should be hard not to be struck by the incredible racial imbalance on display, game after game after game. Teams might put four, even five African Americans on the floor. Thus, 80 or 100 percent of the starting team is black to represent a university that, in most cases, has very few African Americans on campus. Just out of interest on this past Final Four, I checked out the statistics from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Duke had the highest percentage of African Americans on its campus, 7.3%. Then Kentucky had 6.8%, Michigan State 6.2%. I'm very happy to report that Wisconsin, at least, was proportionately true its uh, proportion of African-American students on campus is 2.4%. So what does this all mean? Whites have given up hoops for video gaming. Blacks are better basketball players. Colleges are creating an exploited gladiatorial class. So how are we supposed to cover this? Deny it? Maybe. I remember first time I ever covered the final four, struck by the proportions, I wrote about it, and my colleagues all said, everybody knows that. Second time, there were some rolled eyes. You know, what are you driving at? What's your angle? Are you the racist? The third time, there were editors who thought maybe I should be writing about city politics instead, which turned out to be a good idea. So how can an ethical news organization cover college football, the NFL, without tracking head hits, reported concussions, linking it to the trending of earlier retirements, then following up with the lawsuits and the emerging science? Talk to psychologists and sociologists. A larger question is if we're not headed towards flag football, could we be headed to a future league comprised of poor boys with no better options and psychos who love the mayhem? Is it ethical to ignore or deny the continuing racism, violence, sexism in sports? Is it ethical to opt out by saying, I'm not that kind of sports writer. I'm here to extend the joy of the game. Is it ethical to say, I'm here to cover the news, 
not to make it. There are organizations like the Drake Group and Ralph Nader's League of Fans who cover all that strident and boring stuff. Can you be an ethical sports journalist if you keep denying all that strident and boring stuff? Um, we wouldn't be here if we didn't find pleasure in playing games, or in some of our cases, remembering playing games, or certainly loving to watch the games. We also wouldn't be here if we didn't think that sports matters, but that there is something that matters with sports. And we do know that commissioners and owners and coaches and players are not going to promote health and safety or to combat the greed of taxpayer-subsidized ballparks or to mitigate the impact of win at any cost parents and youth coaches to oppose the negative impact of football and basketball on higher education, or to enforce Title IX properly. Only sports journalists can help sports reach a higher level of well-being, community, and moral health. And only we journalists, taking the spirit of a conference like this, pushing the envelope of ethics until it becomes something of progressive value can guide our trade into a force for reform. The responsibility is ours. We can't leave it to the Player Tribune or even to Bob Costas. We need to find the ethical way to reflect the critical realities of the game's we cover. I think, I think it's a hard job. I think it's going to be hard if you try to do it. But if you had wanted easy, you would have listened to your mother and become a rocket scientist. <laughs> Thank you. Do you? Stunned. Stunned silent. That's, that's what I had hoped for. Uh-oh. I think we often see news organizations, newspapers, and TV stations giving the sports story that becomes a news story, like Aaron Hernandez. They give it to the news reporters. Do you think that this is uh, a good idea or a bad idea, or that should the sports journalists be covering the sports stories that become news stories? I, I know how angry that always made me. Um, and then, because it was important, um, in terms of being hard, uh, what would be harder uh, than a beat reporter having to go back into a locker room that he or she uh, just you know, exposed or, or scraped something away a little bit. So it's, you know, it's always easier to have a, a somebody else do that story, except that too often, and, and this is how I always felt, but too often it seemed as if the paper, in that case the paper, was saying, well, we better let a real reporter <laughs> do that uh, coverage, not a sports writer. I, th I think it, you know, kind of demeans the sports writer. Uh, but sure, no nothing is really harder um, because so many sports reporters are, in a sense, embedded uh, and need access. Uh, although I I've really actually always seen 
that if you were honest and fair, you know, let a couple of days go by, you could always go back into the locker room. So earlier today, earlier today we heard um, Walt talking about the response of Florida State to his reporting and hiring investigative journalists. Do you think, particularly in college, um, these institutions have ethical obligations themselves, especially among their communicators, to be open and honest and transparent and not try to cover these things up? Or is that, is that a game that's over? Uh, don't you think everybody has ethical obligations? I mean, what would be the I circumstances do. when you don't? Uh, so in cases yeah, I mean, where the, we find the whole idea, The whole idea of doing the right thing is really not that hard. You know, we all kind of know what it is. Um, and then we find justifiable ways because it's um, economically not feasible uh, or be a, too much of a problem. Uh, but yeah, of course, everybody has ethical obligations. Um, it would be nice if um, owners and coaches and athletic directors and players, they, they, they all did the right thing and had ethical obligations, but they're not going to. And I think that we are the last line of defense. Um, and if we decide not to do it and let it go, then maybe Maybe this should be, uh, sports should be not part of journalism. Uh, I mean, we talked about ESPN. ESPN has, you know, which is really doing a, a, a difficult job and often very, very well. Uh, ESPN does not have journalism in its DNA. It was not created as a news organization. And, um, I mean, a conflict of interest, as I've written, is too flabby a term. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, yeah, how do you how do you do it? Uh, how, and and I think that you just have to bite the bullet and do it. And I think they've been trying. Hi, Bob. Patrick Stigman from ESPN. Um, oh, oh, really? Perhaps you could talk about some of your it's favorite so nice things you. about ESPN for a moment. No, seriously, um, I know you and I talked about this, but I'm curious for the room for you to discuss the role of ombudsman specifically. It's declined, obviously, greatly throughout uh, media organizations across the, the country, largely for budget reasons and other. But what are we losing in that case, and what do you think the value of, especially having the years, that you, the two years you spent at ESPN, what's the value to an organization to have that role? Um, well, let me just kind of reel back. I mean, first of all, I think that the fact that uh, ESPN will soon announce its sixth uh, ombuds person uh, is an enormous tribute to forces within that organization uh, that does allow a kind of uh, oversight. You know, the Washington Post doesn't have one. Uh, relatively few uh, newspapers and news organizations in America do. Um, I think that uh, ombudsman is a very important position in, in, in kind of, of oversight. Uh, and, and I think it's certainly important uh, for ESPN to have one, and I'm eternally grateful. Uh, Patrick, who is in charge of what is emerging as really the most exciting and important new aspects of ESPN, the, the whole digital frontier, uh, was my handler. Um, Full disclosure, right? Transparency? Didn't you tell me that? Um, at ESPN. And um, it, was a, it was kind of an interesting experience. I mean, he was an ESPN vice president. Uh, and certainly we, at times, disagreed uh, about covering aspects of ESPN. But at the end of the day, 
when we worked it out, uh, he was certainly as dedicated as I was to transparency uh, and whatever truth now means, right? I, uh, I just want to ask a quick follow-up to that, and that is maybe I should ask Patrick, too. Um, what is your sense of what impact you actually had on ESPN? The impact? Impact, yes. Of ESPN? Of the, of the ombudsman position on ESPN. Um, the impact of the ombudsman at ESPN beats me. <laughs> um, I have, I have no idea. Um, did they change any policies, go off in a new direction, uh, had a come to Jesus moment? I don't think so. Uh, Patrick might uh, want to address that. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, uh, it's the, one of my one of my ombuds heroes uh, is Margaret Sullivan, who's the public editor of of the New York Times. I think he does a wonderful job because I spent most of my career at the Times, and I know that um, I don't know most people now, but certainly an enormous percentage of people at the New York Times uh, don't understand what we need an ombudsman for. <laughs> you know, we're the New York Times. Um, and we don't want oversight. And I think that most media organizations you know, feel that way. So immediately, there's a, a resistance to any kind uh, of an impact. I mean, people, people don't like people looking over their shoulders and um, you know, making what seem like moral judgments and critiques. It's certainly understandable, particularly in journalism, where you are supposed to be the, uh, the in a sense, the moral arbiter. So, um, I, you know, Bob, I, I have, I really, I really don't know. So, did I have any impact, Patrick? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think that ESPN, as the worldwide leader and the industry leader, has more of an obligation to set the tone for various sports coverage and, and in-depth studies such as the, you know, the League of Denial and concussion studies like that? Well, I think that um, in, in many ways it does set standards. Um, it certainly makes things permissible or not, um, but, but ESPN, you know that poem, The Blind Man and the Elephant, where a bunch of blind guys are feeling up an elephant and walking around, and each one has a different piece of the elephant and is described, well, the elephant feels like a tree trunk, the elephant feels like a snake, the elephant, you know, feels like a wall. Uh, that's ESPN. ESPN is, is many different things. I mean, you've got some incredibly kick-ass investigative reporters at ESPN, a splendid job, and you have some incredible jerks on the air. You've got, um, you know, what, what's the phrase, hug the harangue? No, enhance, <laughs> embrace the debate. Um, you know, you've got silly shows. Um, you have an insider line of journalism that's really kind of feeding fan fantasy about trades. It seems more for fantasy leagues than anything else. And then you have people who are really trying to cover things in an adequate way. It's, it's an empire of many little duchies doing many different things. And it's, I think, um, and each of those, each of those has their impact in a way, whether it's broadcast or Fine columnists. Um, I mean, certainly um, Nate Silver and Bill Simmons are standards of certain things, 
and um, Skip Bayless is a standard of certain things. So, you know, you can almost pick and choose what you want. It's a good question, though, and unanswerable. Um, sports, probably more than almost any other sort of journalism, the, the line between opinion and reporting is incredibly blurry, as I'm, I'm sure you know and you encounter it all the time. How did you navigate in terms of deciding what to, what to take on, what was fair game for, for an ombudsman to, to criticize when the line is so blurry between fact-based reporting and opinion? Well, I, I had an enormous help from uh, the mailbag. Um, ESPN gets, I can't imagine how many uh, emails a year, and I got about a thousand a month. And I, I read them all. But most of them were, you could read pretty quickly. Um, how is that murderer Ray Lewis still on the air? Uh, why don't you do more hockey? Um, but there was a lot of very thoughtful um, messages. And um, I would say that a very large proportion came from the American Southeast, from white Christian families who were appalled at the way that societal issues, that was almost always the um, tagline, societal issues crept into ESPN coverage, which was not necessarily always fair, uh, but they did. And, and you know, when, when Michael Sam was drafted and kissed his boyfriend, and kissed his boyfriend, <laughs> and kissed his boyfriend, uh, my um, mailbag exploded. And so that was, you know, right away you knew that those were the kind of things that you, you know, that you had, had to deal with. Um, and Bill Simmons, who has a very strong following uh, among a very important younger demographic, um, his audience sent a lot of mail explaining that Bill Simmons was not really a journalist. What he was was kind of a prophet who spoke truth to power and could say anything that he wanted, even if it was kind of unproven. So, I mean, these were the kind of things that sort of, you know, led me uh, in that direction, you know. Uh, and even, even if it was something that I was intensely interested in, uh, I tended to wait to see whether there really was an audience reaction.